I'm going to set the scene really for the film Operation Anthropoid by uh, talking a little bit about um, the book that we've just introduced, Four Square, The Last Parachute. The book tells my grandfather's story, so my gra as I'll, I'll go on to tell you a little bit about his story, but it covers the sweep of intelligence operations across the Second World War, including Anthropoid. So the film itself picks up at a very particular point without telling you all of the events that happened before uh, to set up Operation Anthropoid. And so I'm going to talk through the overlap between my book and um, those early um, days of intelligence, Czech intelligence in the Second World War. But I'm going to start here with a picture. This, these, are, um, these pictures are all from my grandfather's photo album. So he had a photo album which I found which was meticulously arranged in order to tell a story, although he never actually vocalised that story, but it was very helpful for me when I was trying to piece together his story in, in, in later years. Uh, the man on the horse there is Thomas Masaryk, the founder of uh, modern, um, modern Czechoslovakia, uh, you know, or, or of Czechoslovakia as a modern state at the end of the First World War. He was a, a philosophy professor um, and a statesman of some repute, and at the end of the First World War, he formed um, Czechoslovakia from some um, disparate states from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so Bohemia, uh, Moravia, uh, Silesia, which is where my um, grandfather was from, um, Slovakia, and actually Sub-Carpathian um, Ukraine. <laughs> so again, um, a lot of similarities with um, the stories, as, as Michal has already, already um, pointed out. And really, my understanding of, of this is that uh, Czechoslovakia was a noble project. The, the intent, Masaryk's intent, and with his uh, deputy, Edvard Benes, was to create a modern, democratic, um, you know, liberal, but socialist country in the heart of Europe. That was the mission. It was really to, 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 to take you know, control of their own destinies and to create a modern country in the heart of Europe. And so the young crop of uh, Czechoslovaks who were, who were born around that time, uh, including my grandfather, who is one, two, three, fourth from the right here, uh, looking a bit cocky in his um, Sokol uniform. So they were raised, this is a meeting of the uh, Gymnastic Society, the Sokol Gymnastic Society, of which my grandfather was a, a proud and active member. And the idea was this was distilling, um, you know, a sense of national pride, uh, physical um, strength uh, and mental strength into this new uh, crop of um, citizens because they knew, both the leadership and the country knew, that because of its geographic position, Czechoslovakia would have to fight for its continued existence. That was kind of a given. And so that generation were brought up to be fiercely patriotic, and they believed the mission statement. They were bought into the idea of Czechoslovakia. And at the end of the First World War, um, you know, as, as, as time moved on into the 20s and into the 30s, they, Czechoslovakia was paying close attention to what was happening in Germany. Um, the Treaty of Versailles had, had to abandon its uh, military, um, you know, um, army basically and, and, and signed certain terms but of course as, as time went on um, Czechs, uh, Germany began to rearm and over that time um, the Nazi party began to gather uh, steam and gather influence in the country as well. Now this was something that obviously uh, with, a, with, a, with its borders um, Czechoslovakia was very keen to, to know about and to plan for. Uh, this man Frantisek Morovets, General Frantisek Morovets was recruited um, to basically um, sort out the intelligence service and make it modernise it for the challenge that was ahead. So he, he did that very successfully uh, and basically recruited agents uh, in, um, across, um, you know, across Central Europe, across Eastern Europe, um, and, and began to build an intelligence network to help um, secure the country when, as, as for the troubles that they knew were coming ahead. One particular Agent was a, a man called A54. He was a, 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 an anti, sort of not anti-Nazi member of the German military intelligence, and was was one of his key um, key uh, contacts at the time. So as I say, he he, he actually uh, there's a really good book called Master of Spies. Um, I don't think it's still in print, but you can get it from old bookshops, and it's a fascinating read, which talks about this period of how uh, Frantisek Morawiecki gradually built Czechoslovak intelligence service to probably arguably one of the best in the world at the time. And again, parallels with Ukraine. So the weak spot of these, you know, these countries which had been forged together into a new state, uh, as is always the case, their borderlands were a mix of a mix of ethnicities. So there were a lot of ethnic Germans in the uh, on, in the German borders in the uh, Sudetenland. Um, and as Hitler came to power, the um, 
grievances from the Sudetenlanders were amplified and used as a pretext for what, as time would go on to say, Hitler really wanted to do, which was to grab the defensive borders of Czechoslovakia before he took over the whole country. Uh, again, shades of uh, Donbass and uh, everything that's happening in the Ukraine at the moment. So, what happened was in the, um, uh, the famous Munich Agreement, which Michal has already uh, talked about, Czechoslovakia had built, under, under um, Masaryk and its uh, deputy leader, Eduard Benes, had built a pretty capable military. I think there are 20, 25 divisions of troops armed with modern weaponry from the Skoda Works, you know, and they're all, you know, forged from those young Sokol members who'd grown to... Uh, full um, manhood, they were ready for a fight and they were ready to defend their country. But um, <clears throat> at the Munich Agreement, uh, Neville Chamberlain, Edouard Deladier um, met with Hitler and um, the Italian fascist leader Benito Mussolini, and without Benesch even being present, uh, basically reneged on their treaty agreements to fight with the Czechs against Germany should they be invaded, and um, get handed Benesch a fait accompli to say, um, you know, you must give up these, this, this part of your territory, which would be the equivalent, you know, again, in modern day of, um, uh, and by the way, Benesch was told he had to go into exile, so that would be the equivalent of saying to Zelensky, uh, he had to, not only did he have to give up the Donbass, but he had to leave the country and, and give up his, his um, president, so it was a pretty um, dire situation, and so Benesch had a choice, which was, do we fight, or do we, um, or, or, or do we um, take the agreement? And Although the Czechs had, uh, Czechoslovaks had a, uh, a, a pretty powerful army, it wasn't enough to stand up against the might of Nazi Germany without its allies. There, were, there was no real confidence that they would, um, that, 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 that you know, those, the, the, ally, the other countries would come to their defence. And so, with a heavy heart, he made a decision to um, to give up, to accept the Sudetenland, and go into exile. Um, now that. Franciszek Morawiecz stayed in, 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 uh, in Prague, running the intelligence service for the new kind of increasingly puppet government at home. Uh, through his agent A54, he found out that um, in um, March 1939 that uh, Hitler was going to renege on the Munich Agreement and take over the rest of, um, of, Czech of, 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 the, of Czechoslovakia, or Bohemia and Moravia. Um, and so, he, he, he found this information out through his contact, A54, he went and spoke to uh, his superiors and said, this is going to happen. And they kind of just said, well, we don't believe you, um, you know, and played it down. And so Moravec decided that um, he had to uh, basically um, do what he felt was right in this situation. So he contacted uh, the man in the centre of this picture. Again, it's a blurry picture from my grandfather's photo album. The man in the centre there is Major Harold Gibson from British Intelligence Services. Uh, Benesch on the right holding the hat and uh, Franciszek Moravec just on the left. Basically, um, Gibson offered um, Moravec a plane uh, with ten seats, so uh, his wife, seats for his wife and his two daughters and for seven of his best agents. Um, Moravec spent some time agonising over his decision and ultimately decided that he had to leave his wife and his two daughters behind because his, the, the other agents wouldn't be able to take their families and so he took nine of his best agents on that, on those, on that plane to, to Croydon, which just shows the scale of um, the, scale of the um, challenge ahead of them. Now, with Hitler then having um, reneged on the Munich Agreement, uh, Benesch went to action. So he said, well, Hitler's invalidated the Munich Agreement, so I'm the rightful uh, president of Czechoslovakia again. So he, he moved, came to England, um, uh, gathered around him... Um, came to England from America where he was in exile, gathered around him some of, some of his former political colleagues, including Jan Masaryk, the son of Thomas Masaryk, the founder of Czechoslovakia as his foreign minister, and um, basically started and wrote letters to um, Roosevelt, to uh, the League of Nations and others, um, basically stating his claim as president of Czechoslovakia and his, and his desire to form a government in exile. And it was real manner from heaven at his time that, 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 that Moravets and his... Um, his intelligence agents then dropped in his lap from Croydon Airport because he had, uh, through them, contacts with the home resistance, with a radio network being run by former members of the Czech military, uh, and, 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 and th this vital link to intelligence, including to the intelligence flowing from this high-level operative A54. So at the moment, this was, this was one of the, just about the only thing that, um, 
that uh, Benesh had going for him in this, in this fight to reclaim his country. So the mission was to bring the Allies into the war, to get agreement for the complete defeat of Nazi Germany, to get, and to get Czechoslovakia restored to its, uh, to, to, to get the government, provisional government recognised, and to get Czechoslovakia restored to its pre-Munich borders. Uh, and basically all he had was uh, those, th those ten men in the files that they'd brought over from, from Czechoslovakia, which just shows the importance of intelligence. Now here's my grandfather, as a young man, Jaroslav Publik, at this time, and his story is just indicative of the stories of the men you'll see in the film. So, um, they all went on journeys out of Czechoslovakia to arrive in the UK and to be able to start to work with Benesh and with um, some of them directly with um, Franciszek Morawiec on this mission to, to, to reclaim their country. When um, Czechoslovakia was overrun, my grandfather was sent on forced labour to Kiel uh, to build a naval barracks, um, which was not a fun time, from, as he recounted it to me. Um, you know, they were on starvation rations and, uh, and beaten regularly and forced to do sort of... Um, pretty harsh man manual labour, but on Christmas 1939, um, Benesh and Jan Masaryk, Jan Masaryk on the, on the right here, started to broadcast on the BBC radio and saying, um, saying to, broadcasting to young Czechoslovaks, saying if you're able to fight, get yourself to France to join the French army, uh, because at this time France was still in, in the war. Uh, and we're going to form a Czech army under French, under French command um, and, and go and fight for your country. And so my grandfather heard this, uh, walked out of uh, his labour camp in, in Kiel, uh, and somehow um, found his way back to his hometown of Barnov in Moravia through, um, through Germany. God knows how, um, but he did. Um, and when he got there, uh, he met up with his young cousin, uh, Josef Bublik, who is a character who you will see in, in the film. Uh, Josef was a law student, and basically uh, the... Um, the no, the Nazi regime had closed the Czech, Czechoslovak University, so he was back in Barnov at the same time. Uh, and together, the two men decided that they were going to go into exile and they were going to fight. So they left uh, January 1940 with a, a bottle of plum brandy and some sandwiches and their winter coats and made their way through the Budapest. This is all covered in the, the stories of this are all covered in the book through, through Budapest to Belgrade. Uh, were shot at by border guards as they crossed into, into Hungary, um, found their way into Turkey, into Syria, and finally to the um, Lebanon, where they joined. These, these are his papers for joining uh, uh, the, um, for the duration of the war. These are his French papers as he, as he, as he joined, officially joined the Czechoslovak exile army at the French Foreign Legion camp in the Lebanon. And here's a picture, it's a great picture. This is um, either in Lebanon or soon afterwards as they were on their way to France via North Africa. My grandfather is on the back of the camel there. Um, and Josef Public, his cousin, is the tall gentleman smiling uh, just at the front there. So this was part of their... Um, uh, and again, it's a fantastic, an amazing story. Even to, I remember a story my grandfather had told me how they saw the Indian rope trick performed. Uh, you know, it was a real epic journey to get to uh, France. When they went to France, they um, were recruited into um, the army there. And my grandfather was trained as a signaller, which was a um, fateful decision for things that would happen later. Um, Josef was put in the, uh, a separate regiment as a gunner. The men were brought up to um, Paris after Dunkirk. So as the French forces were already being routed, the Czechoslovak forces were brought up to the north of, of France. They were... Um, uh, fought well, but they kept getting encircled and, and uh, you know, as the, as the, as the uh, other, other French and Moroccan forces collapsed around them. And they ended up doing a forced march, uh, basically from Paris all the way back to the south of France. Um, this is their route. Um, the route up is on the right-hand side, the route down on the left-hand side, and it was Nontron where the two uh, regiments joined up together again and Yaroslav and Josef met up again. It was a pretty horrific time for them. My grandfather told me a story of how uh, basically, he just uh, slept while he marched, as all the men did. They, they weren't, if they stopped, they would get killed or they would get caught by the Germans. And if they got caught by the Germans, they would have been executed as traitors because the Germans saw Czechoslovakia as, as part of the, the Third Reich. So it was a pretty low time. Um, they were nearly uh, disarmed. And so on that journey would have been all of, um, all of the, the, the agents that you will see in, in this film, Josef Gabcik, Jan Kubisch, 
um, and, the, and the parachutists that you will see in the, in the film Anthropoid all, all were part of this fighting. In fact, Josef Gabczyk was awarded uh, a Croix de Guerre for his bravery as a machine gunner um, as, as part of, of, of the war. There were probably, I think, a couple of thousand men had found their way um, to fight. So it was a sort of a, a select group of the people who'd found their way. Uh, those who didn't, fought, most of them came on the same route as my grandfather and his cousin. Some of them, I think, uh, Gabczyk and Kubisch managed to get out before Poland was overrun and came through a separate, a separate path to join the French army. Uh, but they were basically the two main routes, either out through the Lebanon or out through, through Poland. This is a photo of them somewhere near the end of that, <laughs> that journey, a pretty sorry and dishevelled looking bunch with no country to call their own. Um, uh, Fran France was signing the armistice with, um, with Germany. They were under threat of, ex of, um, of you know, capital punishment. And basically they got to the south of France. I'm not entirely sure what these photos are, but they are um, from my grandfather's album and I thought they were sort of illustrative of the, of, of the times. They fought their way onto boats. Most of the men got onto a, a boat called the Road Al Farouk, uh, which traveled um, it traveled out from Agd um, past Gibraltar. And one of the things that many of the men remember is as they passed Gibraltar, they saw the uh, task force that Churchill had assembled to uh, capture the French Navy so it didn't fall into Nazi hands. And this was a real boost to their morale. So they, you know, they knew they were on, the way to, on their way to England or to the UK. Uh, and they saw this, you know, from a landlocked country in Central Europe, they saw this mighty uh, fleet uh, and they realised that actually the war wasn't over and there was maybe still a hope, hope for them. So they, they ended up uh, trailed by an Ita Italian submarine. They found their way to, um, to Liverpool, where they were greeted with uh, um, cups of tea and, and jam sandwiches from a, a very welcoming um, uh, British uh, you know, populace. And that was, again, a, a real boost to their morale. So this is that time they were initially put in a tented village in uh, Chomley Park in Cheshire. Uh, my grandfather is in the fourth from the right there in this picture, but he's still wearing his French forage cap. I don't think they've completely outfitted him there. And there are several other men who, um, who are quite well known in, che in Czechoslovakia in this picture, because this is a group of radio operators. And these were the men who were the core of a lot of the parachute missions that were selected. The man on the far left there is um, one of the last parachutists uh, to die, actually, um, who lived to well into his 90s, a man called Jaroslav Klemesh. And just next to him, the tall gentleman there is a man called Chestmere Shikola. So these are all, uh, these were all, um, most of these men either um, saw action as, as parachutists or, 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 or trained um, other, other parachutists. And so they were very quickly moved to a uh, barracks, uh, Morton, pa Morton Paddocks in Leamington Spa became their permanent barracks. And soon after they arrived, um, by this time, Winston Churchill had uh, taken over as a, as a as a leader of all parties in a wartime government for, for Neville Chamberlain. Um, and this was, again, a real boost to Beneshi's cause because Churchill, like him, had the objective of the, nothing less than the complete and utter defeat of Germany. And so Churchill came in April 1941 to inspect the Czechoslovak troops. Um, he was greeted with a, uh, a rendition of Rule Britannia from the men, which um, Jan Masaryk, who, who was a gifted musician, had taught them and, and thought might go down well. And it was at that, um, after that, that um, meeting that Churchill actually originally decided that he should, that they should, um, although it took some time to enact it politically, that Czechoslovakia should um, be, be made a full government in exile. Um, to the right there is uh, um, um, Winston Churchill and, and uh, Mrs. Churchill with Edward Benesch. One of the other things they discussed at that meeting was Churchill had just set up a new organisation called the Special Operations Executive, and its mission was, was literally to set Europe ablaze. And so this was basically, um, the idea was to train up parachutists and underground agents so that um, they could be parachuted into occupied Europe such that uh, when the, when the uh, continent rose against Nazi Germany, which remember at this time, could happen at any time as far as the Allies were concerned. You know, they didn't necessarily know how long the war was going to last. They would have people on the ground who were able to subvert and to, um, and to help with any uprisings. And so um, Benesch agreed with, with Churchill that the Czechoslovaks should be able to make use of the SOE training school. So the Czechoslovak agents, uh, parachutists, were not part of the Special Operations Executive. They were Czechoslovak soldiers 
who made use of SOE training schools. And again, this is, um, this is a picture of, uh, again, with Major Harold Gibson of SIS, and um, more, you can see uh, more of it, and Ben S. But ah, the reason why I put this picture here is the man to the far left there is a man called Emil Strankmuller, who was um, Moravec's deputy. And he was the man who was put in charge of, um, of uh, setting up the parachute, his parachute missions. So he went to um, see the men in, in Morton Paddocks and he recruited the first dozen or so men. Um, and that included my grandfather. And this is uh, something that was in pride of place in his photo album to his dying day, just a month after Churchill's visit, was his invite for Medvar Benesh to dine at Walton Hall as this first cadre of um, intelligence operatives. Now, originally, when they were recruited and they started to do the, um, to plan their intelligence, they talked about assassinations. They were initially going to assassinate, um, uh, uh, look at a guy called Carl Herman Frank, who was the a Sudetenlander, who was the, the chief of police. Or, or there was a, a, a guy called, uh, a man called Emmanuel Moravets, who was a sort of minister for propaganda. So he was a, a, a Czech who'd gone native and was um, pro-integration with Germany. But... Um, as things transpired, the Czech population was not um, quite as um, subservient to the Nazi cause as, as Hitler would have liked. And so various things happened without going into too much details. Um, Benesch did various things to, to demonstrate his control and influence with the local population. And so um, Hitler decided that they needed a tougher regime in, um, in the, the, the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. And so um, they brought in as acting protector uh, a man called Reinhard Heydrich, um, who was, uh, well, not a, not a nice person, let's say. He was a man who had he'd been kicked out of the German Navy uh, to, for um, scandalous conduct, conduct and, and being a thoroughly uh, disreputable person. Because of that, he'd embraced the Nazi party as his way to rise through the ranks and obtain power. Uh, and he had done that very successfully to the point where he was number two to Heinrich Himmler in the SS. And basically, he was brought in to instigate what were called carrot and stick policies. So basically, he wanted the Czech population to do as it was told, make tanks and armaments at the Skoda Works. If they did that, they'd be rewarded with food and rations. And if they didn't, they'd be treated very harshly indeed. So that actually had some um, success, as you might expect. Um, and so it very quickly transpired that the mission that they needed to do was um, to that, that, that Hydric should be the target for the assassination. We're getting now towards the, the area where the film picks up, so I'm just going to try and pull a few threads together to, um, to, to, to tell the story. The first two missions that were sent in December of 1941 were Anthropoid and Operation Silver A. Anthropoid was um, Josef Gabczyk and Jan Kubisch, uh, the two main protagonists of the film you're about to see. But the other mission, which was almost as equally as important that was sent at the same time, was a mission called Silver A. And that was um, Alfred Bartosz was the leader, uh, Josef Valchik was another member, and again, he's a character who you'll see in the film, and Jiri Potacek was the radio operator, who was one of my grandfather's uh, trainees because he was uh, moved to do, be a radio trainer in those initial phases of the war and not actually to be sent on a mission himself. Basically, Silver Ray's mission was to set up a radio network and, um, uh, and get contact with the local resistance because they'd lost their, their radio, basically. That mission was a, was a success, was a, was a great success, and encouraged Benesch and Moravets to continue sending agents into the field. Um, Out Distance and Zinc were two, two other missions that were sent around about that time. A photo from my grandfather's photo album, that's um, the, uh, the man at the top there with his head peeking out, is Ivan Kalarik, who was the radio operator for Operation Out Distance. My grandfather's there in the middle of the, of the picture. And another one of my grandfather's trainees was a man called William Gerrick. So he was sent with a mission, Operation Zinc, which was to set up an intelligence network in Moravia. Unfortunately, it was dropped in Slovakia by mistake. Um, it, um, Gerrick ended up getting separated from the other members of the team. He was only a young man. Um, my grandfather's view was that he was unfit for, for, for duty, wasn't uh, capable enough to be sent into the field, but he had those precious radio skills, so they took the risk. He ended up turning himself into the Gestapo and giving all of his all of the information that he had about the parachute training in the UK, uh, because basically he you know he just decided that that was the best thing for him to do. So 
there were these, this flurry of missions that were sent. Gabchik and Kubish were, were um, casing out um, Reinhard Heydrich to try and work out what his route was to find a place where they could amb ambush him and kill him, um, basically. But time was moving on and they hadn't found their opportunity. So they joined up with Operation Outdistance, to, um, which, and their mission was to bomb the Skoda Works. So they were basically to light beacons so that planes could, could come from the RAF and blow up the, um, the Skoda Works. Now, again, that mission failed. Um, and one of the issues, and it, the, there's a scene in the film which, which, which alludes to this, Basically, they drafted in Gabchik and Kubish from Anthropoid to help with conducting Operation Outdistance. And that was a, done to improve them, you know, for morale, really, to keep them busy. But what it actually did do was it blurred the lines between the missions. So each mission was its own self-contained thing and there wasn't supposed to be communication between them. So, um, basically, through Anthropoid's involvement with Operation Outdistance, which failed in its mission to bomb the Skoda Works, all of these parachutists on the ground worked out um, that Anthropoid's mission was to assassinate Heydrich. And they were terrified because they thought the repercussions for this are going to be, you know, awful and it's going to wipe out the whole of the resistance network. So there were some fairly heated debates, uh, and again, I think they're alluded to in the early, um, early part of the film. Um, Bartosz, this isn't in, in, in the Anthropoid film, but Bartosz sent a message back to Moravets and Benesh in the, the UK and said, please don't send any more agents uh, because we can barely look after who's here. Unfortunately, um, that message wasn't heeded and uh, more missions were sent, uh, the last three being Bivouac, Bioscope and Steel. And the reason why I'm getting to this is um, Operation Steel was a mission to bring a spare radio by, uh, by a 19 year old Slovak uh, called Aldrich Dvorak. And here he is um, receiving his radio instruction with my grandfather. So Aldrich Dvorak is on the left there, my grandfather in the middle. Again, my grandfather on the, on the right and Aldrich Dvorak with the headphones on. So this is him going through his final training before he was sent in early 1942. And the other mission that was sent was Operation Bioscope. So this was a sabotage mission. Uh, and Josef Publik is there in the middle. Um, the other men are Boguslav Kuba and Jaroslav Spark. You will see... Uh, characters playing Josef Bublik and Jaroslav Spark in the film. So they were sent with a, um, a mission to, um, to blow up a railway bridge um, or a power station in, uh, in, in Moravia. Their equipment was lost on, on dropping and um, Kuba was killed in trying to retrieve the equipment. So basically, to set up where we are with the film, there, not, there, were, there, there were a lot, uh, probably a couple of dozen agents in and around Prague um, from various missions at the time that um, Anth the Operation Anthropoid actually happened, so 80, 80 years ago today. Um, and e each of them had their own, um, their, their own story. Many of them are covered in, um, in the film today. So pretty much soon after the film picks up, all of these men were basically moving from safe house to safe house in Prague, um, trying to avoid um, uh, the Gestapo, most of them pretty well aware of what was about to happen and how things were about to get um, quite tricky for them. Now I won't, um, I probably have my time and we put, you probably want to watch the film, but um, so this is all covered, the sort of political sweep of this is all covered in the book. What is also covered is what happens after the film and I won't say much about that because I don't want to um, give you any spoiler alerts um, and I guess you need a reason to buy the book as well if you're, uh, in, if you're interested. But, these are pictures from my grandfather's photo album. He spent most of the war in a, um, a farmer's field in Bedfordshire as part of something called the VRU. So basically a team of about a dozen men uh, kept in, in, in wireless communication with, um, with the agents. So they would have been the other side, or they were the other side of the, of the people tapping Morse code in Prague and in Moravia and elsewhere. Um, and it was a pretty demanding job, 24 seven, um, maintaining uh, concentration, uh, getting these frantic missions. They could almost tell telepathically what was going on because of the speed of people's um, um, tapping and the sudden cutting of messages. It was a highly stressful um, job. Again, um, in the period of 1943 to 1944, some more missions were sent, um, including uh, the one um, uh, Operation Platinum, which was with Clemesh and, and 
uh, chest of ministry from uh, Operation Clay, so the, uh, towards the end of the war. And then when we get to May 1945, um, Britain is a deliberately smaller flag there. We moved to the, to the early Cold War. Um, the United States and, and the Soviet Union vying for control of political control of Europe. And of course, as is always the case, uh, Czechoslovakia caught right between the, the two of them. And, you know, my grandfather never spoke about any of these stories um, in his life until the very end. Um, I uh, did a bit of research, managed to get some information from him and spent probably 10 or 15 years piecing together the details of all of this so that I could understand his role at the end of the war. And that's the kind of culmination of the book Operation Foursquare. And I won't tell you what that was all about. Suffice it to say, it was right at this pivotal point between the Soviet Union and um, the Americans uh, uh, and about how to gain control of um, the, the Czechoslovakia that each side wanted to emerge after the Second World War. And one of the things I did find was, and I've got a copy of it, is his official mission report, uh, which was one of the things that I actually um, used to work out the story. Um, when we get beyond that, 1945 to 1948, Michal's already alluded to the, the, the difficult times for Czechoslovakia at that time. My grandfather was moved to the US occupied um, quarters of, of Berlin um, to work for the Czechoslovak military mission there. This actually, as we get towards 1948 and the communist coup, this is, um, this is, a, this is a promotion for my grandfather. He was working in the foreign office for Jan Masaryk, basically. And uh, this is a promotion for him, um, signed by Jan Masaryk in February of 1948. Uh, and this was no accident, so he was promoting him to give him some political capital uh, for, the, for what Masaryk knew was about to happen. And what was about to happen was Jan Masaryk um, was, I think it's fair to say, and I hope nobody will disagree with me, was thrown from his window of, his, of, his, of the foreign office in his flat by communist agents. There was a lot of um, excuses given and, and claims of suicide, but it was pretty obvious that he was killed. Um, and he was killed because they wanted him out of the way for the communist subversion of, of, Czechos of Czechoslovakia. It was about that time that um, my, some agents came to, um, or my grandfather got notification that he was to be recalled to work uh, from the same building, um, from the US occupied quarters of Berlin. Not a particularly attractive job offer. Um, particularly if you know the details of his mission uh, <laughs> at the end of the war. So in 1948, when the Berlin airlift was on uh, with my one-year-old mother, uh, he managed to get a flight um, to Croydon Airport again, to the same airport that, um, that um, Franciszek Morrow had, had arrived in earlier in the war. Um, my, my grandmother and my mum came um, first, uh, and then he, when they got there safely, he, he, he flew afterwards. And, Spent the rest of his life in exile, um, uh, so was never was uh, was able to return to Czechoslovakia towards the end of his life, but spent most of his life outside of the country that he loved and had fought um, so hard for. But it's not all negative. Just one thing I wanted to show, and it links back into the film. Again, I don't want to do too many spoiler alerts, but this is um, uh, this is a this is a postcard that was sent after. Czechoslovakia regained its independence, you know, through and Václav Havel was elected. Um, I think it was 1990 when Václav Havel met with the remaining parachutists who were still alive uh, at the Church of St. Cyril and Methodius in Prague. My grandfather couldn't make it that year, um, but a lot of the parachutists wrote him a postcard as part of the commemoration. Uh, and you'll see that some, some of the names of some of the parachutists, some of the parachutists like Klemesh. Um, and, and even uh, Carol Google, who was a member of Operation Foursquare. So, there's a lot covered there, but I, I hope it set the film up. So the, the, film, le the film jumps in with kind of t telling the story of Gabchik and Kubish, but hopefully this paints a bit of a picture of why they were there and the stakes involved and the importance of their role. Uh, and as you will see as things, as things culminate, there were a group of parachutists in and around Prague at the time, um, including um, uh, William Garrick and um, Carol Churder, um, who, as you, will, as you will see in the film, um, ended up um, giving information to the, uh, to the Nazis about the other parachutists. So I hope that, I hope that links the... I've tried to weave the two stories together there uh, and lead into the film, but hopefully that's a, a good introduction to, uh, to, to anthropoid the movie.
and I'll leave it there. You can give them some PMA. So I'm not sure how the microphone was working, I'm sorry for that. But uh, I think we have maybe like 10 minutes uh, for questions and answers. So if you would like uh, to ask uh, uh, George uh, anything from what he was uh, uh, talking about, uh, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. My name is Salah Bukova, I'm from Czech Republic, from Brno. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much for your uh, information. I just would like to ask you for a personal opinion. Do you think that if we defeat and did not agree in Minsk agreement, that we have any chance to do anything in this time against the Germans? Um, do, what do I think if, if they chosen to, if Czechoslovakia had chosen to fight? Oof. I mean, it's a, it's a horrible. Without any other uh, support. Oh, yeah, it would have, compare, compare the situation in the Ukraine. Oh, it, would have, it would have, it would have, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not a military expert, so I'm a, I have a very niche, niche, but my, my understanding would have been that it would have um, seriously degraded uh, Nazi Germany mm -hmm. before it reached its, it would have stopped a lot of munitions falling into German hands, it would have um, certainly fundamentally changed the course of the Second World War, and it would have, um, it would have been a validation for all of those, um, all of Czechoslovakia, a sort of moral or, it would, they would have felt a lot of, of pride regardless of the outcome, I think, much as the Ukrainians, you know, have, can rightfully take a lot of pride in, in the stand that they've been able um, to make. And I guess the reason why I spelled it out was the, re the reason why a lot of people like my grandfather um, left, because they wanted to fight and they would, you know, that, that was the point. They didn't want to just give up and they wanted to fight. So, um, uh, certainly, they, as I understand it, the Czechoslovak um, army, although smaller than the German one, was well advanced and well trained and high in morale. So, um, you know, um, I don't think Hitler particularly wanted to have the fight. I think he was much happier with the way things played out. invasion of Ukraine there was a lot of read across from history. Um, Chamberlain's capitulation and the uh, Munich Accord as, as you rightly pointed out. Is there read across in a, in a, in a, in a, in a world where you know, nuclear armed nations face off? Or did we not learn the lessons? Did, did, did Europe capitulate in the face of um, years of, of signals from, from Russia um, post-2014? Has the weakness of Europe effectively led to what has happened, do you think, um, in, in, in Ukraine over the past uh, four months? And again, um, you know, I'm not a, a geopolitical, I have a very narrow niche um, interest in this, and those are big questions. I mean, I think Europe has done, I mean, so I would look at it the other way, which is the parallel I drew earlier was, if things had played out like Munich, they would have given up the Donbass and um, Zelensky would have been told to go into exile. That would have been the direct equivalent. So actually, Europe's probably done a bit better this time. Not perfectly, but it's done a little bit better. I mean, okay, you might say the Crimea or, you know, maybe, maybe, they, maybe, maybe that was the equivalent, but um, 
it's a horrible, you're right, it's a horrible calculus, isn't it? We will, you know, the, the repercussions of resistance, as we'll see from this film, can be quite, well, quite horrific then, but they could be even, even worse now. But at the same time, um, if you capitulate to threats of force, then you're a slave forever, aren't you? Yeah, particularly holding a World Cup uh, football in a, in a nation that's obviously on the war path, obviously, with the yeah. former capitulation. Yeah. Hi. Um, Julian Anderson. When I was in Prague recently, I was told that in the Czech Republic, the Munich Agreement is actually known as the Munich Betrayal. Mm -hmm. I just want to recall that fact mm -hmm. because I am. Um, I didn't realize until relatively recently, we were not taught this at school, that Benesh, nobody from the Czech Republic, from Czechoslovakia, was permitted to go up. Yeah. 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 Which, no one teach you. Nobody taught yeah. about that. They taught about what it meant, but they did not teach that the Czech Republic, the Czechoslovakia, was not represented no. in Munich. And I, I still find it staggeringly arrogant. Well, and of course, um, the Soviet Union made a big play of that um, and, and you know even though it was at least morally uh, bound as well and of course soon forged a cynical pact with Nazi Germany and carved up Poland but it was very happy and, and played in a lot to the narrative about the Western betrayal uh, so there was a lot of ampli amplification of that not that it wasn't true because it was true yeah. but it was it was utilized by the Soviet Union to sow discord and in fact the one of the things I certainly found was at, at every I mean, it's a classic one, isn't it? The Allies won the, wanted to win the war and the Soviet Union wanted to win the peace, but um, at every turn, the Allies were outflanked in public relations and propaganda by the Soviet Union. And of course, then that all came to, ro came to roost in, in, in 1948. Um, uh, and so there's something about the, the betrayal, <coughs> which is certainly, was, was uh, certainly um, strongly, um, the Soviet Union was very happy with that that message to be amplified, not that it's not true. So you're, you're saying is that it was exploited? It was exploited, but it's still true. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other questions, I would like to ask you for one more round of applause for George, because I can do the job.